Hola, buenas tardes. Good evening. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, welcoming you to En Casa con la Plaza Dan Guerrero Happy Hour on a wonderful Thursday night, December 7th, 2023. Imagine that. We're almost finished with the year, but it's been a great year and a great year of uh, En Casa con la Plaza Dan Guerrero Happy Hours. And now we're going to... Uh, First of all, I'm going to give you just a little bit of an update what's going on at La Plaza. Of course, there's always a lot going on. We have our exhibitions, uh, 18th and Grand, the Olympic Auditorium. Uh, our permanent exhibitions always starts here, Calle Principal. But in a couple weekends from now, we're going to have, a, a, like, a, a, we usually have five family days during the year, Cinco de Mayo, of course, Fiestas Patrias de los Muertos. But this year, we're collaborating with the Smithsonian and our two fellow museums here, Japanese American National Museum and Chinese American Museum. And all three of us are going to be hosting a family day. In this case, it's the Mi Los Angeles Family Day. It's part of the Smithsonian's Our Shared Future Initiative. Uh, since December 1st, uh, just last week, we've been doing a series of programs at our facility, La, La Plaza at CAM, Chinese American Museum and the National uh, Japanese American National Museum uh, and talking about uh, our racial past. Uh, it's it, it illuminating, it's it, very insightful. Some We've had panels, we've had uh, uh, tonight at La Plaza Cocina, we're having a cooking demonstration. Uh, and then that day, December 17th, 12 to 4 p.m., we have our family day. We invite you all, it's free of charge. We're art workshops, entertainment, Los Cambalache, an, an incredible Son Jarocho group. Uh, we're, Little Libros is gonna be doing some uh, some book reading, we're good. Gustavo Arellano is gonna, gonna come down to La Tienda and have a book signing. So it's gonna be a jam-packed uh, a day of activity free of charge. And then you could also visit Chinese American Museum and Janum, Japanese American National Museum. They're having their family days at the same time. We're giving away tap cards so you could get on the Metro. You could walk down across the street to Chinese American Museum, take the Metro down to the little Tokyo station and visit Janum and then come back to La Plaza and, uh, and have a great time. All right, so that's it for this commercial. And now let's bring on the host of Dan Guerrero Happy Hour. Mr. Dan Guerrero, please join us. You are happening down there, wow. You know, you, you can't beat La Plaza and the program. You just can't, you just can't. And it's not just because I'm here, it's the coolest place ever. That's right, and we're already getting set to, uh, to, to we're setting up our program for for next year, for 2024, and it's going to be once more a fantastic year of programming, of events, of exhibitions. Of course, most 95% of it free of charge to our community. So come on down. It's amazing. Is it already fluffed up for Christmas? I haven't been down there in a couple of weeks. All the decorations up? They sure are. And if you come on down, uh, you'll see that we moved our, our entrance. Usually we have it on Main Street. We were trying to see, give it a test to see oh. if people could come down the, the, the paseo walkway through our patio uh -huh. into uh, our admissions area. We have a wonderful Christmas tree there. If you go up to Caen Principal, our exhibition on the second floor, all decorated. Our staff just, they went to town. And uh, yeah, so, and if you come to La Tienda, that's beautifully decorated as well. And you could do your holiday. Well, hey, hey, well. Christmas shopping at Tiendita. Tien there they have fantastic you know we love Oveda street but most of it is is cochanidas we love and little things but they beautiful jewelry and 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 clothing and books there at la tienda that's uh yeah if i worked there i'd be spending all my my check there if i was physically there yeah i try i try to avoid it as much as possible sometimes you, know, you just got to go down there and there's artwork and most of it is from local vendors artists artisans craftspeople uh, it, it's to supporting our community. Yeah, I, I love the tienda. I don't go there too often because I always spend too much money there. Because <laughs> the stuff is not cheap, cheap, cheap. I mean, there's all prices of things. But of course, I always gravitate to the most expensive. I don't know why, but I just do. It's a curse. <laughs> it's a curse. There can be five items and I don't know the price. The one I pick up will be the most expensive. I guarantee you. I don't know why. You got the good taste, <laughs> I guess so. Well, I guess so. Um, so anyway, holidays, we have a, a holiday encore show coming up, right? On December 21st uh, exactly. for our happy hour. 
Right. I, I'm, it I'm was. I, did, I didn't get around to getting the graphic done, but but we will be promoting it like crazy. It's one that you did. It, uh, it, it, it was a good one. It was maybe two Christmases ago. I don't. I, at least three. It wow, because we've been we've been doing three years. So it was the first Christmas, yeah. and we had Louis Perez from Los Lobos and Linda Ronstadt. And it was fantastic. And they both talked about their Christmas albums. And and it's never been seen since that one time. So don't miss it. It's really terrific. So the next happy hour is on December 21st. And it'll be uh, Linda and Louie. Linda and Louie. That sounds like a cheap duo in the Vegas lounge. <laughs> what are those 50 doo-wop duos? Yeah, do up, do up. Anyway, you should take a little breather. I have another beautiful guest, beautiful physically and beautiful in her heart. She's a, she's a lovely woman. I love her. So um, go away. And we're going to meet uh, tonight's guest and we'll see you a little later. See you in a little while, Dan. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, so our guest tonight is a, is a singer and a songwriter and music producer. And uh, she literally has, you know, people talk about the music is in their blood. It is in her family DNA. I mean, uh, it's a legendary family and music dating back to the 1800s in Arizona and Mexico during the uh, the German migration that come earlier. And it's a fascinating background. And we'll get into that at, at one point uh, later in the show. But uh, this is about our guest. And she, like so many young Mexican-American uh, uh, men and women in the country here, grew up uh, musically loving two worlds. You know, she loved Marvin Gaye and uh, Lola Beltran. And she loved the Beatles and she loved... Uh, um, Pedro Infante. She was big on Pedro Infante. So we're going to talk about that. And her musical career actually uh, also celebrated that same duality, uh, as you will see. So let's uh, hear it from her herself. Please welcome and zoom in Marisa Ronstadt. Hello. <laughs> How are you, pretty lady? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy you could do it. I know you're busy getting Christmas ready for your two daughters and your hubby and everything. That, and I'm also an hour behind you, so this is typically my get ready for bedtime. Are you I'm back in Phoenix right now? Yeah, we moved back. Stop it. I thought you yeah. were here. No. So I lived in LA for about 17 years and then yeah. we moved back to Phoenix. That I knew, but then I thought when I saw you, um, we we did a show together at the Ford for Susie Garcia and everything. And I thought you would move back to LA. No. Wow. No, we're back here in Phoenix. Hmm, well, we'll talk about that a little later on, because, of course, I, I'm a Tucson boy. I'm a Tucson boy. So uh, we'll talk about that. But thank you for doing this. And I toast you for staying up so late. Salud. <laughs> oh, what's that? Nice Chardonnay? Yes. With a little bit of Pellegrino. Oh, little, all right. It's a little spritzer. Little, little, little bubbly. Let's talk about... Um, about this this duality of, of the of the two music worlds because uh you did grow up you know like all of us did you loved both both music but when you did start singing which was about the age seven mm -hmm. or eight you were singing rock and roll and country and top 40 and all that with a group back there in phoenix so and and we have a photo of that time <laughs> so, so uh where is it abelardo is, is this with that group, Amigos? Yes. Yes. So the Amigos was my foundation. Um, I started performing with the Amigos at the age of seven to wow. 18. And I learned about the different genres of music spanning, you know, top 40 music spanning from you know, the the flapper era of the wow. Charleston to you know bebop and big bop and the big bopper and to country and to swing music jazz I mean you name it we we did it we performed it as kids we had the opportunity to tour Germany a couple of times wow. my sister went at the age of eight I got to tour at 14 and 17 
And it made such a huge impact in my life to be able to, to sing and perform and, and, you know, do all these things that I love in another country and oh, yeah. people are so appreciative of it. Yeah. I mean, what wonderful things at, at that age, culturally to, to see other lands and meet other peoples and other cultures and getting to know the American songbook as it were. So yeah. was everybody your age? They were all little. I mean, that guy looked like a teenager or something. So it, it, it ranged from the ages of seven to 18, the, the gentleman in that picture, his name is Brian Acosta. He has an amazing voice. He was one of my mentors as a kid. And he continues to sing here in the Valley um, with a cover band that he has called Power Drive. And, you know, and everybody that I got to perform with in that group, they are still either musicians at heart or working musicians such as myself. Wow, that's fantastic. Because sometimes people love it and they go off into other careers, but that they really took it as, as careers and not just something they did. For oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that that was the experience. And it was also at the time, you know, for, for myself in the 80s and the 90s, getting away from other potential pitfalls that I could have fallen into uh -huh. as a as sure. a kid, you know, as a teenager in being in gangs or drugs or all sure. of these things. And this was a way for my mom and dad and for my sister and I to not experience any of that and to grow in our artistry. Now, um, when did you discover you had pipes? I mean, you didn't just show up and start touring. I mean, you discovered your voice very early early obviously probably in the womb so i i i knew that i loved to sing when i was a kid but when i was little my voice was very deep and raspy to the point where my mom took me to the doctor to make sure that there wasn't anything wrong with me <laughs> <laughs> and my youngest actually has that same voice right now and the doctor just said no she's fine it's just it's just her voice so around the age of six and seven, I would just make up my own songs and sing in the backyard of this very house that I'm currently living in right now. Wow. And there was one day that my dad came home from work and he heard me singing in the backyard. And I I purposely was singing super loud because I wanted to get my dad's attention mm -hmm. because I believed in myself. I thought that I could sing, but you know, dad's approval means everything. And he walked out there and he was like, you you can sing you can sing and that's when they put me into the amigos and kind of followed in that trajectory as my sister so you just went into it with your your god-given voice you didn't start so i did but i was still too little to be put on the front uh -huh. you know right like that first line of defense of the stage if you will yeah. and around the age of eight or nine, I auditioned because there were new auditions. There were, you know, the the director of the Amigos, his name is Bob Diaz. And he always wanted to give everybody that was a group member an opportunity to do. To have their were, moment. Yes, to have their moment. Okay. And I was one of the younger kids at the time. And I got up and I sang this song called Carolina. Mm -hmm. And it is a kind of, a uh, pre-chorus to Charleston, the actual song, Charleston, yeah. Charleston. Yeah. Made so I sang that at the age of eight and the director was like, oh, oh my God, I, um, I have to get her trained. So I started to work with a vocal coach Good. and I was able to record the Christmas album that we recorded that year and, you know, really got to participate and be molded if you will and given opportunities to be exposed to different types of music i found a quote online you know you, you you can't do anything in your life without it being online but a quote from you describing yourself as a kid and this is what you said i crave to be the center of attention at family events i love to entertain no matter how clumsy or silly i was i didn't care what people thought of me i was happy did you feel you were an awkward child? And yet you got it. I was, I was the kid that lacked rhythm, that had two left feet. Um, I was the I was the awkward 
ugly duckling kid for a long time. And I was okay with that because honestly- But you look beautiful in that photo. You're I know, but, but I that's the way yeah. that I was made to feel at that time. You know, I was bullied as a kid and, you know, by, by kids that were 10 years older than me. And I looked a lot taller than I was you know, versus my age. Uh -huh. So they treated me the way that I looked. And mm -hmm. I kind of built this armor around myself, which was like, give it to me, give it, to me. <laughs> bring it, it on, bring it. it on. And there were many times that I wanted to quit even that young, like, you know, at the age of 10, and having a conversation with my dad that was like, look, you can quit. It's fine. If you want to quit, quit. But don't tell me that you want to sing. Don't tell me that you want to perform because you're quitting. So we're not going to talk about this again. Whoa. And that conversation was like, he's right. Yeah. We should so say who your it. daddy is because he's famous. Jose Ronstad, very loved, very loved, long time TV news uh, man and journalist and MC and everybody loves Jose Ronstad. Yeah. So I'm saying he, it was interesting because people, you know, most parents try and talk their kids out of going into the business mm -hmm. and either because it's so foreign to them, they don't get it. Or in the case, both of us, you know, because they're in the business, they don't want the kid to do it because they know how hard and crazy it is. But your dad, that was very smart. He doesn't look that smart, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I said that because I think he might be watching. Hi, Jose. So <laughs> I love your dad. I love your dad. But that was, that was brilliant. That was really brilliant of him. I'm, I'm impressed. Good for you, Jose. No, he's, he's, my dad is the kind of person that's like, I'm going to give you all the tools, but but I'm going to crack doors open for you. You have to open it. And that meant a lot to me because, you know, moving to Los Angeles, I was able to forge my own way. Mm -hmm. Tools that my dad and my mom had given me. So it means a lot to me now knowing that having moved back to Phoenix, I did everything I said I was going to do when I moved to And LA. you're still doing it. And you're I'm still doing, doing it. it. Yes. Uh, I, hmm. I, um, I was going to jump somewhere, but it, what the hell? Let's jump. We can do whatever we want, right? I was going to say that, uh, obviously, uh, your dad, Jose Ronstadt, as well. Um, it is a famous name. And, and, and having a famous name and you're in that same genre if you'd become a scientist or a math teacher it wouldn't matter but that that could be a double edged sword i would think as your dad said he could open the door but then it's up to you you can open the listen d did frank sinatra junior ever do anything no and that that <laughs> That father opened every door for him and that crappy Nancy who had one hit in her whole life. So, you know, you got to have the goods. Well, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I'm just, you just, <laughs> you're Dan Guerrero and you can say whatever you want. So I'm just, I'm just enjoying it. <laughs> but it is true. You, you have the goods. I mean, you're beautiful and you have the pipes and you're going to hear a, a clip of her, of her voice a little later on. But anyway, so yeah, did you feel there was any negative, like you were, had to live up to something because you were a Ronstadt? Because your, your cousin, who we'll talk about later as well, was already famous by the time you were little. So when I was little, I was, you know, my sister and I were the kids that woke up to music in the morning to clean and to or not music in the morning just my mother being like hey you know it's time to get up let's let's start cleaning like that's what we did and uh -huh. a lot of those times my dad would play music from the Beatles to Linda and being that young I didn't understand the impact that Linda had already made in on the world right. in the I, mid 80s it happened early for her it happened yes and I didn't really understand also the complexity of her identity being a, a Chicana being still 
you know, in the mainstream of the 60s and 70s genre of pop rock and roll. Like it's mind blowing, really, if you think about it. Yeah. And it wasn't until I became a teenager that did it, did my mind go <laughs> like I related to this lady. Yeah. <laughs> and by that time, I had already, you know, chatted with Linda several times. And by that, you know, mid teenage to late teenage years did we really get to sit down and talk and she was like hey this is what you want to do yeah you got to learn your craft get comfortable do all the research go to go back to school she told me to go back to school I didn't go back to school <laughs> um, but I did do the research and I did study and I did pay my dues and I did everything that she advised me to do and her advice and the time that I have spent with her throughout the years is you know super sacred to me because she's not not just because of her fame and popularity but because she's a brilliant yes I, list singer yes. songwriter producer activist Chicana like she's just she's ch admirable and I and I am so thankful to you know not only to look up to her as 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 an idol of sorts but to carry the same last name as her and my father. I tell people all the time, she's the real deal. You know, you you know, really? you know her Python, but as a person, as a human being, she she's is legit. extraordinary. She's so smart and so funny. Oh, just and, so and, quick. And, and down, very down. There's no stardom in her no. at all. No. Yeah, I, 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 we, we have a mutual fan club there. So you eventually moved to L.A., which, of course, everyone must do. You go to New York or you go to L.A. if you want to have a career. You don't stay in Duluth or Phoenix or or Tucson. So you come to L.A. and you meet a couple, a young man and a young woman who are just starting their career as well. And you know who I'm talking about. And tell us about that period. So I didn't meet them I then I encountered them a few years prior. So I was already a huge Quetzal fan, um, a bigger fan of, of Doctora Marta Gonzalez. Yes. Her, oh, Doctora, I always forget she's the Doctora. She's, yeah, she's <laughs> profe, dude. Like she's, you know, she's the real deal as well. Yes. Um, I was captivated by her voice and her lyrics and her melodies and her harmonies it was it was euphoric for me as a as a young woman in her 20s in her early 20s and when they came through town they opened up for Osomatli and uh -huh. my husband and I went to attend and and we encountered them in a parking lot at the at a venue here in Tempe and I was and my husband was a little tipsy and was like hey <laughs> remember my wife you're going to work with her I promise you, or remember my girlfriend at the time, we weren't married yet. Remember my girlfriend, you're going to work with her in a couple of years. And they remembered me. And uh, through a mutual friend, Quetzal and I connected and he was like, hey, come over. Let's, you know, let's see what you can do. And they are such wonderful. I mean, obviously they're extremely talented as musicians and, and, you know, Sandino as well their son yes yes but beyond that their sense of community mm -hmm. is something that i learned about los angeles when i moved well when i was here in phoenix at the time in the early 2000s there's this competition happening you know with like local bands local cover bands there's this competition and i just i wanted to work with people i wanted to write with people I didn't want to sing any more covers at the time. And Marta and Quetzal gave me that gift. They opened their doors up for me and they welcomed me literally into their house for days on end to songwrite. They fed me. They introduced me to oh. El Sereno community, to the East Los Angeles community. And Quetzal and Marta are also the reasons that I ended up becoming the lead singer of Monte Carlo 76, which was the first band that I got to work with and write for um, upon moving to Los Angeles. Now, is that is that different from from the know-it-alls? 
I, I, yes. That is different from that. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. So this was the first band that I got to, I mean, the, the first rehearsal that I attended, um, the, the band director was like, we're going to play a tune. We don't have any lyrics to this tune. Why don't you, let's see what you can do. Mm. And I came up with a song that started with cruising on this freeway. And it was the end. It was the, that they were like, okay, we got it. Like you're, you're, you're in. And it was such a fun journey to songwrite with Marta, to work with Quetzal, to be in the studio with them, the coaching and the knowledge that I received from them. Wow. And how is, long a period was, was that whole chunk that, that, oh, that was about, that was about a year and a half for the Monte Carlo album. And then right after that, um, Monte Carlo kind of fell apart, but there were, there was another band member. His name is Jeremy Keller. Him and I had already been working on new songs and we were like, let's just, let's do our own thing. Let's call it by your name. Let's use your name to, to the best of its ability. And let's call it Marisa Ronstadt and the know-it-alls and the know-it-alls came from a song uh, that was extremely uh, hit me dearly was uh, Stevie Wonder and he's Mr. Know-It-All. So that's where. Oh, that's where it came from. Yes. So, so all this time you're, 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 are you strictly singing and writing in English? Cause I know the money um, actually comes no. later. You're... No, I, I wrote one tune in Spanish that I initially wrote, but I'll, soy pocha and we all are but I'm, we're proud of it we're proud of being pocha. Capitana pocha and i wrote it wrong and quetzal completely like schooled me and sat me down and was like hey we're gonna rewrite this thing <laughs> so we did and it's called cansada that song and it's on my my uh blueberry moon album oh they're beautiful they did the show they did the show the happy hour they're they're, oh, they're also beautiful they really are there and Sandino, yeah. you know, he's like that. Guy, oh my! He, I got to play with him a couple of years ago. He's he. I asked him to sit in with me for a gig, and my God, he's, he just—he's a sponge. He just sucked up all of his and talent. Yeah, I'm surprised he left him with anything because he's—he's really—he he really is. Yeah. He's amazing. He is. He the is. whole family is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it goes beyond. You know, the Gonzaleses and Gabriel. And, yeah, that, Gabriel I've known for years as well, and those are good people. You know, it's, it's amazing wonderful. because people talk about our business and cutthroat esto and, and those people are no. out there for sure but i got it and that you. was not that was not the experience i had and and i did have a couple of brushes with those experiences yeah. i had a couple of producers that contacted me <laughs> via craigslist in uh -huh. you know 2006 yeah. 2007 i recorded some tunes i showed it to quetzal and he was like stop messing with those people let's go to work and so i did and i i learned a lot no, I, I purposely, you know, removed myself from that scene because it's it's real and it's scary as you as you. It know. is, but the truth is, and, and and I've been in this business thirty five years before you were born, and they, I swear I could count on one hand the the sleaze balls, honestly, or the bad experiences, two or three maybe. And I've known millions of people, you know, in the New York theater to out here to the Chicano. And it's good people. It's beautiful people. And especially, I think, especially among the Chicanada, you know, we're very protective of each other. We yes. all feel like we're one family. And we're all like uplifting one another. Yes. But yes. that wasn't something that I felt here in Phoenix at the time. And I think I was searching. I was searching for something I didn't know that I was searching for until I found sure. it. Sure, that's right. And that's, something, something's out there. I don't know what it is, and then it shows. It shows yes. up one day. And you know, when when my husband and I decided that we were going to move back to Phoenix, I sat down with Quetzal and I was like, "Look, this is something that I would like to do in my community in Phoenix. Like, I want to build a network of of Latino, you know, musicians to be able to to." do the same thing and, and kind of create that same model out here and maybe beyond, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because there's so much talent within our communities. And I feel yeah. like 
now more than ever, we're starting to see it. Yeah. Because of technology, because of social media. And you could live anywhere these days, especially you're a known person. You know, it's not, I have a friend and uh, uh, she's a fantastic jazz singer, tra travels all over the world. And her partner grew up in Tucson. And after years, she's a New Yorker, they moved to Tucson. And I said to Ann Hampton Calloway, and I said, to Tucson? She goes, well, it's a little harder for me to travel because, you know, it's not nonstop to uh, Paris from uh, Tucson, <laughs> but uh, you can live anywhere now, a home base. You, you really you know? can. And I, I feel like we really learned that during the pandemic. Yeah. You know. And, and things like the Zoom, one of the few rare things that came out of it. You know, you can have meetings, you can have conferences, you can, you know, voice voice lessons. Do that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, when did the whole Mexican mariachi thing come in? When you really started? Because I think in in most in recent years, most people associate you with that. We have a photo here we could have shown earlier, but it works here well too. Uh, do we have that with Jose and? <laughs> <laughs> you, you you're a teen there you do look that so i was i'm teen. not even a teen i am i'm 11 years old there oh my god really yes wow and 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 is that the first time you had seen her do canciones no no this was like because that was 91 so i saw her do canciones like in 87 when i was seven. tell me about your reaction when you saw her doing Mariachi music after growing up and getting all everything else. Well, first, I think I have to start with the Tucson International Mariachi Conference. And right. my father was the MC of that conference for years, six, 37 years. And, you know, as supporters of my father, my mom and my sister and I would go every year. Yeah. And when Canciones came out and she came out on that stage, Dear Lord, it was, it was, yeah, it was like, like, I can't even describe it. It was mind blowing. It was heart shattering, but in a positive way to like exploding all of these wonderful feelings about my culture that I didn't really feel like I fit into all the way, but she got me there because she sounded just like me when she spoke. <laughs> it was Chicana, Bocha Tambien, you know, just like me. <laughs> and I felt seen. I felt like, okay, if she can do that, I can do that. And that's where the love began, you know, uh -huh. listening to, to the mariachis that backed her, Los Camperos. I mean, Jesus Christ, like Los Camperos de Naticano. Yeah. Mariachi Cobre. A cobre. I love them. Nuevo Tecalitlan. Yeah. Like, you can't go wrong. No. Being backed by world-renowned musicians. World-class musicians. World-class musicians. They can hold up to any symphony at I don't care where. You know, uh, they're great, great musicians. The great mariachis, you know. Yes. And they all have pipes. They all sing. Oh, yeah. It's just like Jesus. They can they can play those instruments like that and, and sing like that yeah. while wearing that sombrero <laughs> <laughs> and those pants, honey. Let's yeah, and those pants, which is why okay? they can sing so high. Yeah. <laughs> you you know you know the first you know where <laughs> you know where I first saw canciones where on Broadway. Shut I was still living in New York. I was in New York during, I was in New York all the 60s and 70s. Oh. So I was in New York and she uh, came and I, I had not met her yet. I didn't meet her. I didn't know her at that time. And I went to see it and to see our people, our culture on a Broadway stage. It, when that is just saw, like, oh. yes. You you never saw Latinos in, in 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 on Broadway West Side Story I guess, as gang members I guess in the fifties but you never saw Latinos on Broadway at that time really and to have her out there 
the powerful big name that she was singing our songs in our culture in a Broadway house with all these gringos there and plenty of Latinos who may never have gone to a Broadway show before. It was a religious experience. It really was. She's the definition of crossover for- Oh her. gosh, yeah. But much more so for you and I, because we are mainstream and we are Chicanos, Latinos, Mexicanos, you know, like these things are- are they they resonate with us so much oh god so what i can't believe like what an experience for you yes yes wow. it was and then later when we became such good friends she said why didn't you come backstage i said what am i uh, your dad my Bye. dad i mean what was i gonna do <laughs> She was she was already a superstar when she did canciones. So you know, yeah. we laugh about it to this day. We're always like, we should have grown up next door to each other. I said that would have been good. That would have been good. But um, I have another quote for you. I love giving, and and usually the artist has no memory of having said the thing, right? Okay. Well, well no, but this is a good one. Um, well, it because it because it's. I, I want to talk about overall the Ronstadt family thing because it is such a fascinating story going back to, I guess, would be your great-grandfather or uh, it's hard to keep up. But but here's what you said about the family connection. Generations of Ronstads made music and have been entertainers before me and will continue long after I am gone. It's part of our legacy. It's deeply rooted within my soul. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud to be a very small blip on this particular historical map mm -hmm. and it is a the your family background is fascinating and it all started with a very handsome gentleman named Federico Jose Maria Ronstad mm -hmm. who was born in Sonora in 1868 and this was there was the German migration to to northern Mexico to to Sonora uh, who brought two fantastic things they brought beer making <laughs> and they brought the accordion mm -hmm. yeah which is a great piece of mexican music la banda right. that, yeah that was from the germans and mexican beer the german uh influence there yep so did 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 your dad fill you in on your whole family legacy growing up or did you just know linda was your cousin and that was about it my dad my dad fed us the information when we were ready. Uh -huh. We were, and you could appreciate it when we were asking questions, like, "Are we related to her, or do you know her, or you know those those kind of things?" And then it was self discovery for myself and my sister, realizing that there's a a place that exists in Tucson for specifically honoring the Ronstadt family, right mean the legacy is real and there was a time period when I moved right before I moved to Los Angeles that I talked to my dad about losing the last name and going by another different name because I did not want to be the kind of vocalist that was riding anybody's coattails right right and my dad said to me this is your birthright this is on your birth certificate we're not making this up. <laughs> this is your name. Use it to your benefit. Your talent is going to show people what you can do. If it's not there, it's not there. And people will not give a crap if your last name is Ronstadt. <laughs> I, and you know my dad. You, Doesn't that sound on par? I'm with seeing Jose through new eyes. I'm telling you, what a good daddy he was. He he's, he still is. He's you know my sister and I go to my dad for uh, lots of advice. Uh, uh, but he was you know he he gave us the information when we were old enough to really appreciate and understand it. Um. What interested me about about Federico is that he was that rare human who was a brilliant businessman because he made a great deal of money uh uh as a, as a as a wagon maker you know in those days as you know and i'm saying this to people who may not know yeah. you know uh, 
they they did he made the not he personally but his company made the wagons that burros pulled to work in the fields and they made the fabulous carriages for the wealthy ladies and he went back and forth tucson mexico when there was really no border you know and uh so he was a brilliant businessman but at the same time he had music in him already he was a flautist and he started the first philharmonic orchestra in tucson Mm-hmm. And and to have the both sides of the brain that that's that's unusual, don't you think? Yeah, but I see it in Linda, and I, yeah. I see it in my dad. You know, my dad doesn't do the music thing, but he is a huge part of the entertainment industry in regards to mariachi music and his role oh, sure. in bringing you know mariachis crossing them over and being their biggest advocates and promoters. So. And here, here he is introducing you. This is the first time you was was this Tucson? First, yes. So it's the first yep. time you you sang in a, in a big mariachi conference concert like that. Correct. It was, and it was, <laughs> it was like a a child's my my child dream come true. Oh. Um, I saw Isha Herrera sing when she was. I think seven or eight next to Linda at the Tucson International Mariachi Conference. And we're the same age. And I just remember looking at the stage like, oh my God, she looks like my age. I can do what she's doing. I can do that. And the Herreras, you know, they're super freaking talented family in their own right. But my dad was like, okay, if this is what you want to do, this is what you need to do. Let's go with the voice lessons. You need to at least learn the basics of guitar. You want to, you know, learn the basics of piano to learn scales, like these kinds of things. He opened up these doors for me. So, but my passion also lies in lyrics and harmonies. As a kid, I remember sitting in my dad's study, look, reading the liner notes of Michael Jackson's Bad album to see who produced what, who was a songwriter and what. And there's no internet in 1987. Like, this isn't a thing. So I'm writing this stuff down as a seven, eight-year-old, you know? Oh, already and, looking at the business end of it. That's interesting. And that's And that's my point. Yeah. Like, I want to know, I knew that there was more than just this recording. Who's involved? Mm-hmm. You know, wanting to to have that knowledge and to have some kind of an understanding. That's amazing. That is amazing. I think people should hear you. Don't you think people should? I mean, you don't have to sing, but I have a little clip here because when uh, <clears throat> they were celebrating uh, the 30th anniversary of Linda's Canciones, you performed at the John Anson Ford here where you and I worked recently. I was so happy for, I've known you for many years, but we had, I don't think we'd worked together really. Not like that, no. And it was such yeah. a, such an honor and such a gift to work with you. Like your you're you're a light you really are you're a light and you're such a pleasure and i love everything that comes out of your mouth <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for that but anyway uh we have a short clip because at, at the ford you you uh you uh were part of that big celebration and so we're gonna we're going to uh play this clip now okay <laughs> That's great. That was great. That was great. Now you have two daughters. How how old are they now? 
Um, Amaya Lolita is 11 and Alexandra Lucia is eight. Wow, they're babies. Are, are any uh, singers in there yet? Ah, uh, there's definitely one that's fallen in love with the theater. We actually ah. went to her theater performance tonight and she's starting, I can hear her memorizing songs, like her favorite songs in her room, but she's on the verge of becoming a teenager. So there's a lot of closed doors and, you know, <laughs> privacy, mm -hmm. but my other one, she likes more like makeup and girly things. And this was around the age that, you know, I discovered that I loved music and wanted to fall in love with it more than I did just listening to it, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm, I'm starting to see that with her now because she wants to know lyrics, which was something my mom and I talked about this evening. Um, she said, you were the only kid that I knew that wa that was very frustrated that you couldn't sing along to songs. So you wanted me to teach you what those lyrics were. And my youngest is starting to do the same thing. So mm -hmm. And we'll lyrics, see. I don't want to pressure anybody. No, no, no. But you know, lyrics hardly exist anymore. And so many songs you hear, and I'm going, where's the lyric? Where's the story? It's, you know, it's a I different. Agree. Yeah. But it's the stories that I fall in love with. It's the, oh, yeah. Oh. I mean, a really great song. I mean, it, it's a three act play in a, in a three minute song. Yes. You know, it has a beginning, a middle, an end. And, yeah, yeah. I'm big on lyrics. I'm big on lyrics. I'm, I, I'm, I, I always mangle them because I can never remember them, but I do love them. And oh my I God, do. Dan, I'm the worst. We would be the worst then because I'm the, the one that corrects everybody on the lyrics. Oh, okay. Well, next time we work together, remind me to hide in the closet somewhere while we're doing that. <laughs> you have been so wonderful. Thank you so much. Let me toast you again. You've been the Ooh, best. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank oh. you for thinking of me. Say hello to your daddy. Send him my love. We've worked together a few times. He's a funny man. Loves you. He loves you. Oh, give him my best, please. I will, absolutely. Wasn't that interesting? It was It was more than interesting. It was really enlightening. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, fascinating conversation as always, but this one was really special. I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you so much. So you have thank a you. great holiday with your family. You. And, and I'll see you, I've been allowed on the 21st for our holiday show. You should tune in if you didn't see that one, Marisa. It's, it's Louis, I will. Louis Perez and, and Linda. Yeah. I will. Absolutely. I would love to. It's a fun one. We'll send you the direct link. We'll send you the direct link. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm a lot of I'll see you in a couple of weeks. We'll see you soon, Dan. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. And thank you who joined us tonight on uh, in Casa con la Plaza, Dan Guerrero Happy Hour. It was a great one. Uh, they, they all are, but this one was really special. I, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you did too. Uh, if you didn't catch the entire uh, session or if you'd like to watch it again, uh, we'll be posting it on our Facebook page and on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA. So please uh, uh, come on down to La Plaza LA when you have a chance. We're open until the 23rd of, uh, of December, uh, a couple Saturdays from now. And we'll be closed for a couple weeks. Uh, we'll be reopening on January 9th of the brand new year, 2024. But you have plenty of time to come down to La Plaza, check out our exhibitions. We have our family day program coming up on December 17th from 12 to 4. Uh, again, in conjunction with the Smithsonian, uh, Chinese American Museum, and the Japanese American National Museum, Mi Los Angeles Family Day Celebration. Uh, so it's free, of course, uh, as is admission to our, to our exhibitions. We're open Monday, uh, excuse me, Wednesday through Sunday, 12 to 5. And of course, come on down and shop at La Tienda, our museum gift store. Uh, some incredible local artists and artisans who share their work with us, and we want to share them with you. So uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks to La Plaza's uh, board of directors, our staff. I mean, we're, we're heading towards the, the end of the year. It's been a jam-packed year at La Plaza, as always. Uh, but this one was a really uh, incredible year. And uh, thank you for joining us, and nos vemos hasta la próxima, hasta, las, hasta la, la vista. Bye-bye.